The Eight Pieces of Brocade is a very popular Qigong set with a number of variations including a seated variation which makes it very accessible to people of all ages and physical ability. I'm going to go through and analyze the movements in this set based on the version that I know but I'll try to reference other versions that I've observed and the differences between them. The first movement or posture in this set is known as two hands hold up the sky or uphold the heavens. This movement is performed by interlocking the fingers with the palms facing up or supinated then raising the palms to the chin level at which point the palm turns over and the forearm pronates to continually face upwards. At this point also the eyes look up towards the sky and then upon reaching the top position the head tilts down and the eyes look forward. One of the cues in this position is to press upwards as if you're like reaching for the sky. A variation includes rising up onto the balls of the feet accentuating this pressing up uh, cueing. So now I'm going to look at the state of tension and direction by looking at the joint position and identifying the muscles or muscle groups that are involved. Starting at the top here, we see that the fingers and wrists are in full extension. The interlocking of the fingers and pressing up accentuates this extension in the fingers and the wrists as well. As a result, the wrist extensor muscles here highlighted in red would be active and shortened to pull the wrist into extension and you'd have a reciprocal stretch on the opposite side here and here of the wrist and finger flexors. This pulse possibly also stretches the palmar aponeurosis which is in the palm of the hand. Now to clarify the blue lines represent what I'm calling a passive tension or muscle that is being lengthened due to tension on the opposite side. So this would represent the antagonist muscles or muscle group. And the red lines signify the active muscles or muscles being shortened. The direction of the arrows is determined by which joint is fixed and which one is moving. Here in the wrist, the wrist and hand is allowed to move so the direction of pull in the wrist extensors is pulling up towards the forearm and as a result the opposite is happening on the other side with the antagonist the muscles being pulled away from the elbow towards the wrist. The pronation in the forearm may increase the stretch along the biceps above it because the bicep or at least the biceps brachii is a assistant to pro, uh, supination of the forearm and therefore would act as an antagonist to pronation. So we have a possible stretch on the bicep due to forearm pronation and then the triceps are active in pulling the elbow straight or into extension which would result in a stretch or passive stretch on the biceps as those are the elbow flexors. Now as we move down you can see here in this shoulder area it gets a little more complicated. We have the deltoids and then a number of muscles which interact with the scapula which is involved in bringing the arm overhead. So starting with the deltoid muscle the anterior deltoid which is on the front part of your shoulder is involved in, what, in shoulder flexion or lifting the shoulder or arm in front of you and now overhead. The antagonist to that would be the posterior deltoid. So I've shown that here in blue arrows as being passively stretched or lengthened. Now if we zoom in there's a number of arrows going in different directions in this area here. These represent different muscles. The red arrow here is the upper trapezius. The red arrow here is the lower trapezius. 
and then we have the blue arrow here is the rhomboid and here is the levator scapula we have another blue arrow here representing the serratus anterior okay, let's take a deep look at the scapula and the attachments to the humerus or the upper arm bone this image here shows the posterior and lateral deltoids and how they connect between the scapula and the humerus here the posterior deltoid in red here you see connects to the humerus on the other side so when this when your arm goes up overhead this deltoid will get stretched it's possible that the, that the lateral and anterior deltoid are both engaged I imagine there's some uh, activation across the deltoid maybe half and half um, of the lateral deltoid might be activated with raising it overhead and the other half would be more like acting like the posterior deltoid being more passive and when the arm raises overhead the scapula rotates uh, laterally outward and this is achieved by activation of the upper trapezius here and the lower trapezius here we see here the connections of the upper trapezius will pull the this side of the scapula this way and this will pull it down creating an outward or counterclockwise looking at this one this would be the right arm rotation now the other direction is achieved by activation of the rhomboids and the levator scapulae so the rhomboids will pull up at an angle here and this will pull up here creating a rotation this way or clockwise in addition to the rhomboids and the levator scapula the pectoralis minor on the other side of the body or that goes along the front below the pectoralis major pulls the scapula downward helping that rotation on the other side of the body I also need to mention here that the serratus anterior which connects on the other side of the scapula helps rotating the other way by pulling down this way and around the ribs now although the serratus anterior helps to rotate the scapula outward when you're lifting your arm overhead I've indicated the direction as passively stretched because the scapula is not protracted and is pulled back the serratus anterior is the main protractor of the scapula bringing it around the body so it's possible that there is some shortening here in the serratus anterior but I would believe it is predominantly stretched returning to the front and moving down the body I mentioned here the pectoralis minor muscles which connect to the front of the scapula and connect down into the ribs the chest is open and the scapula is rotated outward which is the opposite of the function of these muscles and therefore is represented by a passive stretch or the blue lines uh, same goes for the pectoralis major indicated here because the pectoralis major connects to the humerus and helps pull the arms inwards the arms are up overhead which adds a stretch to the pectoralis muscles represented again here is the serratus anterior and then we have represented by these arrows the rectus abdominis and the external and possibly internal obliques these are all would be all stretched as the rib cage is lifted up the sternum is lifted rib cage is lifted and the space between the pelvis and rib cage is extended returning to the back same area we have the lats represented here the lats go from the spine and connect to the humerus now the humerus is lifted upper arm is lifted above the head and therefore we have a passive stretch on the lat muscles now pulling downward I've 
identify these two arrows here and these are intended to represent the quadratus lumborum or QL muscle. Now this muscle isn't always identified as a trunk extension extender but I've put it here just in case. Uh, it could be involved, may or may not, I'm not sure exactly. Trunk extension could be accomplished by the erector spinae muscles that are along the spine and they connect from the sacrum or tailbone all along the spine up to the occipital muscles in the back of the skull. So these definitely contribute to trunk extension and when pressing up and extending the trunk, even though it's slight, uh, there's a possibility that it will be active. So this, these will be pulling down, bending backwards the trunk. Now the pelvis in this exercise is kept relatively neutral which may be in a slight anterior tilt as when walking the pelvis is in, in a slight anterior tilt. Holding it that way while pressing up the glutes have to activate to prevent the pelvis from tilting into further anterior pelvic tilt and resist and act as a uh, stable point for the contracting actions of the QL and or erector spinae muscles. The hip flexors, which will be the iliopsoas muscle in this case, will act antagonistically and be passively stretched. So now here's an image of the pelvis and we see there's a slight tilt and anterior pelvic tilt this way. And here's the femur here connected into the side and now we have the glutes in the back here this area connecting from the the iliac the posterior iliac this ridge here along the top of the pelvis the sacrum and tailbone back here and connecting down into the femur uh, which would mostly be actually connecting into the IT band to be more precise. So when this contracts it can either pull the femur this way or if the femur is stable it can pull the pelvis down this way. Now conversely the Iliopsoas, which is the combination of the iliacus muscle and the psoas muscle. The iliacus connects on the inside of the pelvis here or the ilium and then wraps around and connects to the femur. The psoas connects to the spine and wraps around, goes through the ilium and connects to the femur here. So now when this contracts, it can do basically the opposite which will pull the femur this way if the femur is not fixed or if the femur is fixed and not moving it will pull the pelvis down this way into anterior pelvic tilt basically you can think of hip flexion as the reduction of the angle between here and here and hip extension being a reduction of the angle between here and here. So besides the direct hip flexors and hip extensors of the glutes and the iliopsoas, we have other muscles which provide um, action on the pelvis. So we have the rectus abdominis which comes along the front of the body and connects all the way down to the pubic bone down here and we have the external and internal bleeds all which connect to the rectus sheath and tie in to the iliac crest here so contraction of either of those provides a tensional force which would pull up or vice versa could pull down if the 
pelvis is fixed or acted upon other forces such as the glutes holding it in place or or iliopsoas so if you if there's a force here pulling up this wants to pull it into uh, anterior uh, posterior pelvic tilt meaning tilting this way the forces of the iliopsoas which connect down here would have to contract to pull it back this way and keep it stable likewise for the erector spinae muscles along the back here if these are active uh, and the trunk is fixed it will create a pull up this way putting the uh, pelvis into anterior pelvic tilt tilting that way tilting forward or if it's remained stable by action of the glutes pulling down this way now when this contracts this is stable so it wants to pull up here but it can't so now the trunk if is not fixed will pull the trunk down here putting your the body into trunk extension this is the way I've drawn it in this posture glutes are active holding the pelvis in place and the erector spina muscle is contracting pulling the upper body into a slight trunk extension as you see here glutes here holding it down trunk extension and then which would result also in maybe some additional tensile forces pulling up in the counter uh, opposition of the tilt of the forces this way so your glutes will be active holding the pelvis stable the erector spinae muscles put the trunk into extension which will result in a tensile pull in the opposite direction along the rectus abdominis and muscles related to the rectus sheath and the rectus sheath itself so I've used these lines to represent the iliopsoas. The lines here represent the anterior or knee extensor muscles. Now there's a lot of muscles that connect into the pelvis. There's the rectus femoris. Uh, basically all around all the muscles of the upper thigh connect to the pelvis, including the ones in the back, like the hamstrings. Um, it's hard to determine which muscles exactly would be active in this position without a EMG study. So I've just marked the ones associated with knee extension as being most likely to be engaged and pulling up to extend the knee. Now the muscles on the front of the leg are being contracted and active or shortened and active. The muscles at the rear of the leg and the upper thigh are the antagonists and would be passively stretched. These would be the hamstrings and other muscles that are knee flexors. Now the intent to push up all the way up into the sky, especially if raising onto the balls of the feet, would indicate an activation of the muscles at the back of the lower leg colloquially known as the calf muscles like I said which ones are activated precisely gastrocnemius or soleus um, I can't tell exactly as they both are contribute to plantar flexion of the foot in addition the if you're really intent on pressing down you'll be pressing down with the toes even and that would be the muscles in the foot which flex the toes themselves so you have a pull upward all the way through the foot and a reciprocal stretch on the anterior part of the leg down to the through the top of the foot now one of the things we can see here looking at the front of the body is a continuous line of upward tension going up the body all the way up into the palms of the hands 
on both sides of the body. Now this sometimes goes from front to back as it does here along the thigh it's going up and then you have to go to the back of the body where the calf muscles engage and are pulling up here. Similarly is what happens in the upper body. It goes to the posterior deltoid, to the bicep, then back to the anterior part of the forearm. Better illustrated that way. Now one important area is the rectus sheath here, which would be in the middle of the body here. And you have a pull of the pecs this way and the rectus abdominis and the external obliques all pulling upwards in this upward direction. What we can also see is that entire chains are being under tension in a general same direction, uh, especially from the knee upwards. One other thing I like to know is the effect of cueing or the intent of the exercise. Pushing up to or holding up heaven is like you're holding up the sky. So if you really put intent here, that will increase the activation of all these arrows here and then on the rear of the body as well all of these active muscles will become more active and this idea of uh, contracting antagonist muscles or antagonist pairs antagonist agonist pairs is utilized in what's called PNF stretching, if you've heard that before. A muscle is stretched and you contract, contract the opposite muscle, the antagonist muscle, to create a what's referred to as reciprocal inhibition of the muscle being stretched to allow a further stretch. And then also there's techniques in which you contract the muscle you're trying to stretch to, to get an active uh, tension increase the tension in that uh, muscle to also allow for more flexibility and active range of motion. If we look at this exercise and see if intentful action is taken that you'd have the same result. So all of these blue lines would increase in tension when intentfully pushing up and as if you're holding up the sky the overall tension in the body would be increased and increase this stretch across all these blue lines. Now this reciprocal stretch could be neuromuscular just due to neurology but it also could be related to the fascial connections between the muscles. Um, I believe it's a matter of both. Fascia is highly innervated and therefore Tension going through the fascia would signal back to the nervous system, which in turn would create in changes in neuromuscular activity. We also know from a, a study or two that verbal cueing can change the muscle activation of a person performing an exercise, especially when they are not using a load that is close to their one rep maximum. In addition to the forces on the rectus sheath, we would also have forces on the thoracolumbar fascia, which is in roughly in this area, due to pulls from the lats here and here, the glutes, the ob oblique muscles, and the QL. If we use Tom Meyer's Mount Fascial Meridians, presented in his book Anatomy Trains, we can see that this posture provides tension along the superficial front line and also the superficial front arm lines. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, let me know in the comments and hit the like button. Please share it and subscribe to my YouTube channel. 
and hit the bell notification so you next know next time I put up a new video and new analysis for the next Qigong movement in this set or any other video.